So good day, everybody. Here we are back with um, Inspirations, Passover Inspirations. And I wanted to share with you a, uh, a question that one of my congregants, a 16-year-old uh, high school student at our Passover Seder, asked me. It's an amazing question that I've asked myself a lot of times uh, over the years always bothered me. But we'll talk a lot about things that bother us. And the question was, why did God harden Pharaoh's heart during the plagues? So Moses is asking uh, Pharaoh to let the people go. And uh, in order to demonstrate how uh, serious and how important this request is, um, he is demonstrating, he's creating these plagues uh, in the name of God. And he's saying, Pharaoh, look, uh, you know, God um, is asking me to take the people out of, uh, out of slavery, to free them. And um, I'm here as God's representative, and I am uh, asking you to let them go uh, in order to prove to you that I'm not uh, just making this up. Um, I'm going to, um, you know, point my staff or point my hands up to the heavens and uh, you will uh, witness a plague come upon your people. The first was uh, the blood in the Nile, the next was uh, frogs and then lice, etc. Et and after each plague, uh, after the, the, the five plagues, first plague, so Pharaoh says, no. No way, I'm not letting go of my slaves. Who are you? Who's your God? I don't know any God, any gods. Um, you know, I am the God, in fact, uh, says Pharaoh. And, and after the sixth plague, the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth plagues, uh, it says that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. In other words, even Pharaoh wanted to, was tired of the plagues and was becoming convinced that it's to his benefit to let them go. And uh, even, even then, Pharaoh was compelled by God to say no and to carry on, to suffer, to experience the remaining uh, five plagues until the firstborn. And then finally, uh, God allows Pharaoh to... Um, to agree and to free the Egyptians. So this is uh, strange and disturbing. And my young student um, uh, and, and um, community member uh, asked me why. <laughs> so I wanted to uh, share some commentary by uh, some classical commentators, the Rambam, Feast from the Talmud, and it's discussed this answer is not so simple for two reasons. One reason is it's hard to ask why God does things because God is, even though God is presented in the text as this person, the super person, you would say, that has moods and does things and has a will and gets angry and is happy and is loving and uh, has all kinds of attributes. Um, the truth is that we can't understand. I mean, it's hard enough to understand the psychology of a human being. It's hard enough to understand the psychology of a person we want to help. It's hard enough to understand the psychology of our intimates, our spouse, our children at times. And by definition, how can we understand the psychology of God, which is not really uh, on par because God is not another person, it's not another object to my subject. In other words, anybody else is an object to my perceptions, to my, um, you know, to, to, to my relating and to my analysis, if I want to understand. But God is not an object in my reality. Uh, God is in a whole other order. God is the context of my reality. So in some ways, the question why in and of itself is a little difficult to understand uh, and that is that takes us a little bit more into the mystical uh, framing of this issue. 
which we may or may not get to in this episode. I, I do want to get this, this, this topic may take more than one uh, video. But I do want to share um, some explanations on the, on the level of kind of the understanding of the relationship and the dynamics uh, as it, when it comes to ethics between God and, uh, and us. And I'm going to share with you teachings from uh, Nechama Leibovich's book, Studies in Shemot and Exodus. Uh, and she brilliantly reviews the classical commentators. We're going to look at the Rambam and at a piece from the Talmud, Reish Lakish, who was a great Tana um, of the, um, uh, who's quoted in the Talmud. So let, let me jump right in. This is um, in Exodus chapter 7, verse 3. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. So this is Parshat Va'era. And in fact, um, here, this is before the plague start when... Um, when God is explaining to Moses, asking Moses to go and, and free the people from uh, from Egypt, God is giving Moses a little bit of a uh, of a heads up, an explanation of what's going to happen. Let me read uh, Nechama Leibovich uh, for us. These words are spoken to Moses even before the actual struggle with Pharaoh had begun. Prior, prior to the onset of the ten plagues, they were intended to inform Moses of the course events would take. Nevertheless, we do not find any allusion to this divine hardening of Pharaoh's heart in, in relation to any of the early plagues. On the contrary, it is stated that it was Pharaoh who hardened his heart, his own heart, entirely of his own free will. And this is how it's stated in the Torah uh, during the first five plagues. After each plague, God, uh, far, Pharaoh is hardening his heart. In other words, he's shut down. He's not open to the um, request to send to let the, the slaves go. Only after the sixth plague, which is the plague of boils, Shechin, do we find the fulfillment of the divine promise made to Moses with which we have headed this chapter. Then Adonai hardened the heart of Pharaoh so that he would not listen to them. As Adonai had spoken to Moses, now it's the beginning. God is hardening the Pharaoh's heart. Now this is troubling. It's troubling because it's messing with the <clears throat> the key the key principle the key privilege that theologically that we know from the torah and from the uh, you know the the, the, the volumes of, of rabbinic interpretation that a human being being human is based on the freedom to choose to make moral choices in other words I have the, the, the maybe a fork in the road, a moral ethical fork in the road, road, and I can choose the good path or the bad path. I could choose a path that would cause goodness, be helpful, bring light and power and goodness and justice in a situation, or I can <clears throat> choose the path that causes pain, that inflicts suffering on somebody, that creates injustice, that is is oppressive to somebody, that is selfish, you know, for me. <clears throat> and I always have that choice at any given moment in life, especially in, in uh, certain situations where the, the choice is really clear. And this is a foundation of being human that 
God as powerful and as almighty and as uh, uh, creative and original and as much as God is the context and as much as God sets the rule. Um, some, you know, there was a time when God was uh, uh, thought of as the, the grand clockmaker. So God makes the clock, made the world, set it in motion, right? Wound it up and then the clock uh, continues to tick on its own. <clears throat> so as, as grand a clockmaker as God is, once God sets the world into motion, within the world, us human beings have free choice. Um, that's a foundational principle in the world, in human life, in God's world. It's by design. And here God is taking away free choice from Pharaoh by directing Pharaoh's attitude, not giving Pharaoh a chance to decide whether he will comply with the request or not comply with the request to uh, free free the people. <clears throat> so it's disturbing, on, it's disturbing on, on, uh, on several levels. First of all, poor Pharaoh. Don't you feel sorry for him? I mean, his free will, free will has been taken. Second is, God, you can't mess with the rules. You know, you set the rules to be so, and this is just too confusing. What about free choice? Isn't Pharaoh human? Doesn't he get to play by the rules that, that we all play by since the creation of the world? And that's what's disturbing. So the foregoing texts have puzzled our commentators down the ages because they seemingly contradict the principle of human free will, which is an axiom of Judaism. <clears throat> so Professor Leibovitch here will uh, uh, review in the book several uh, classical commentators, but I'm going to jump forward right to the Rambam, Rabbi Moses uh, ben Maimon of the 12th century uh, the great Rambam, and uh, here is what he says. There are many passages in the scriptures which seem to contradict the principle of free will, says the Rambam, and many have been misled by their tenor. They imagine that the Holy One, God, preordains man to do good or evil. I shall, however, provide a key to understanding these passages. When a man misses the mark of his own free will, he is punished. So here we have the principle of punish and reward. So when, when, a, when a person sins out of his own free will, by design he is slated to be punished. Sometimes in this world, sometimes in the hereafter, in the world to come, and sometimes in both. So this is, this is very, these are basic foundations of uh, Jewish philosophy, cosmology, the way, at least in the 12th century, the way uh, they saw the world. And so there's reward and punishment. And <clears throat> when I choose to do something wrong, there will be a consequence. Now, the consequence can happen in my lifetime. It can happen in um, a future lifetime. It can happen in the world of the soul after my death. Or, or it can happen, the consequence will be in both worlds. By the way, this is a little similar to the way Buddhists talk, talk about karma. Right? So I, I perform an act, and the consequence is going to... Um, present itself to me uh, sooner or later the Rambam continues when does this apply when a person does not make amends in principle I'm supposed to be punished but if I repent if I make amends if I correct the wrong action then the consequences are not there to be had. But if a person makes amends 
Repentance is an antidote to retribution. The same as a person's sin is of his own free prompting, so is his repentance. So free will works both ways. Me and you are, we have free will to choose to miss the mark, to wrongdo. I don't like the word sin so much. It has a lot of connotations, so I'm going to actually use wrongdoing or, uh, or um, missing of the mark instead. That same free will also applies to correcting, correcting course, making amends. You know, making restitution for something we have done wrong. But now there's an exception. So if this is the base, there's also an exception. And here goes the Rambam. But it may sometimes happen that a person's offense is so grave that he or she are penalized by not being granted the opportunity to turn from his or her wickedness so that the person dies with the, with the sin, with the wrongdoing that he or she committed. So the Rambam says, okay, but what if a person is did something that's so terrible that simple correction is, is, is likely to be even relevant? We're talking about a pharaoh. We're talking about a Hitler. You know, there is, there's the edge of the extreme where evil is so evil. It's not going to be as, as simple as, um, okay, you know, let me make amends. I'm going to uh, say sorry and, and oops, and I didn't mean it. Slavery, the way we treated the Native Americans, murder, rape, you know, these things that are so hurtful. It's just hard to just come and say, oh, I'm sorry. Um, you know what? Let me do you a favor instead and, and we'll balance it out. There's a, a, a woman in the community who was just released out of uh, jail, um, Judy Clark, after 30 years. She, she was part of a terrible crime where two policemen were, were shot. And um, she, she was a getaway driver, um, and uh, she she was uh, sentenced to life in prison. She just got paroled. So we supported we supported her process. We we meaning I I, I among others have uh, supported her parole because I was convinced that she made amends in prison. She got a master's in social worker. She's become a, a exemplar citizen of, of the uh, prison community, helping others, um, you know, really making up, recognizing her, um, the, the, the stupidity, the, the wrongness of, uh, of this robbery. But robbery is called the Brinks robbery in Nyack. Um, a lot of people are um, around here in the county. It's, it's a famous, um, horrible crime that happened in... Uh, you know, in the 80s, I believe. And when I listened to the case that most of the relatives of the victims made for not granting her parole, I listened carefully. It had merit. Because what they did, you know, the murder that they committed was so grave you know, the loved ones of these families, these police officers who were out there to protect us, they will never come back to their families. The sense of revenge, the sense of, of, of wanting justice and wanting her and the others to rot in jail is understandable. For those sins, a simple I'm sorry or a simple correction is not so hard to come by. So the Rambam here, let me read this again, but it may sometimes happen that a person's offense is so grave that he is penalized by not being granted the opportunity to turn from his wickedness such that he or she dies 
with the wrongdoing, with the stain that they committed. We may conclude, therefore, <clears throat> says the Rambam, that it was not God who forced Pharaoh to do evil to Israel. God didn't do that. Pharaoh had free will. And what Pharaoh did was that he oppressed, he enslaved, and he murdered Jews at such a large scale that even when he had the opportunity to correct it by releasing them from slavery, what God does is God diminishes, compromises his free will until until a future time. And obviously the future time is after the, the 10th plague when eventually uh, he is he is granted the, the, the opportunity to, to repent, to make a correction. Let me share this uh, um, quick uh, paragraph of the Rambam when, he, when the Rambam talks about uh, free will, so you get the contradiction. This is the Rambam. No one forces preordains or impels a person to take one of these two paths. A person himself is the sole arbiter of of a person's own free will does he or she incline to whatever way he or she wishes to take good or evil. This is a fundamental principle of Judaism. Man, man and woman are absolutely free to perform any deed, any deed, be it bad or good. And obviously this doesn't apply to Jews, this applies to human beings. If so, how could God deprive Pharaoh of the power to repent? And there is a contradiction. But a closer look will soon clarify matters. And again, I'm back with uh, reading uh, the words of uh, Professor Leibovitch. The final decision always rests with a person. At the beginning, however, a person is free to choose any path of action he or she desires. So you'll see now that there is a change in the principle over time and in the process of a person's involvement with either good or evil, the rules will shift around a little bit based on the duration of that endeavor, of that commitment. At the beginning, a man is free, a man or woman are free to choose any path of action. A person is afforded equal opportunity to good or evil. But as soon as a person has made the first choice, then the clock starts ticking. Then the opportunities facing him or her are no longer so evenly balanced. The more a person persists in the first path of his choosing, and specifically with regard to evil, the harder it will become for him or her to revert to the good path. Even though the person's essential freedom of choice is not affected. In other words, it is not the Almighty who has hampered a person's freedom and made the path of repentance difficult. It's the person, him or herself, by his or her own choices and persistence in evil She has placed obstacles in the way leading back to correction. You see how it's the question of free will and of hardening Pharaoh's heart is really rooted in a very complex dynamic of how choice works in the world and especially the choice to do wrong. So I'm going to finish here with um, with a beautiful quote by Reish Lakish, and this will uh, give us another sweet twist on um, on the 
on this dynamic. And the twist is, is that there is a difference, as you can see, between the choice to do evil and the choice to do good. And here's Reish Lakish from, um, from the Talmud. This Shabbat uh, 104, page A. Amar Reish Lakish, my dichtiv, im le leitzim hu yalitz, ve lanevim iten chen, vali tamar potchin lo, vali taher mesayin lo. Said Reish Lakish, what is the force of the text, and he's quoting here from Proverbs, if to scorners he will scorn. In other words, if a person gets involved with scorners, he will be scorned. God will scorn him or her. But to the meek, he will show favor. So if a person gets involved with those who are, um, you know, pure, unharmful, good, good-hearted, if you choose to be with good folks, then God will show you favor. So says Rich Lakish, if a person tries to defile him or herself, he is giving an opening. If a person tries to purify himself, he is help from above. Now notice the difference. Well, it, there's no symmetry here. God is not treating the one who chooses to be with scorners versus people versus the person who chooses to hang out with uh, with people of good of, of goodness of good heart good intent and good action there's no symmetry now here's what Rachel Lakish is saying he who wants to defile himself is given an opening you're given we're giving free will if you choose to do bad, God will open the door for you. It's okay. Follow your choice. You know, this is this is basically um, this is the price of free will. He who wants to purify himself is helped. Ultimately then, it is the person himself who chooses who opens or hardens his heart? The Almighty helps him on his way. But the positive help afforded the good man, the person, is not to be compared with the passive assistance given in the form of removing the obstacles in his path, should he choose evil. So there's an interesting principle at work um, and let me summarize with that. When a person chooses evil, the door is open. There's passive assistance. But then the opportunity after that choice is for a person to correct and repent and do teshuva and find his or her way back to Alignment, alignment with him or herself, with the divine, with, with goodness. But the more a person continues on the evil path and does not choose to repent, does not have an awareness of the error, the less, the less available the opportunity will be. In other words, the the divine, the universe, is going to, um, you know, is going to call less and less and less and less credit. So the longer the evil continues and the larger its scope, um, the the harder it is for the person to then choose to correct it. That is what's meant by hardening a person's heart, hardening their ability to shift and to choose correction. A person who chooses uh, to do good is actually at the very onset is being helped with that. And the more, you know, the more they uh, continue on that path, the longer they continue, um, the more the benefit, the more, um, you know, credit, spiritual credit in, in the bank they accrue, uh, you know, to their benefit, to the benefit of, of uh, the world around them. 
So what a sensitive, good question, uh, my congregant. I, I did not ask his permission to... Uh, um, to say his name, so I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, keep his anonymity out of respect. But um, a, t a young, sensitive, and smart teenager who asked why, how come the Pharaoh is being denied the opportunity for free will, as any human being intuitively would have, and that is that is the complex answer. It has to do with who, who the Pharaoh was in the scope and duration of his choice to be an oppressor, to be a murderer, to be arrogant, to be egoistic. Unfortunately, given that, that, that the rules of the game are so the Pharaoh was at the rare extreme where his heart was hardened and his and the and the opportunity to repent and to correct was taken away from him at least throughout the five plagues. With that, we're going to conclude. Thank you so much for uh, exploring this topic with us. I'm Rabbi Ruben Wodek with uh, with Makom Halev Community and Hebrew Learning Circles here in Nyack, New York. It's a beautiful spring day. And I thank you for uh, joining this discussion. I would love to hear your comments. I would love to hear your ideas. We're going to come back to this uh, very same topic tomorrow, uh, going into a little bit more of the mystical uh, and the deeper uh, angle on this dynamic. Uh, today we just hit the... Um, you know, a bit of the surface, even though it was delicious enough as as such. So come back tomorrow for more. And um, we're going to uh, look at some uh, Hasidic and, and mystical com commentators on the same topic, uh, dig a little deeper. But would love to hear your opinions. Uh, comment below, like and subscribe. It is such a pleasure to share with you. Thank you for studying Torah with me today. Uh, that is it for now. Goodbye. Have a great afternoon.